And that's an excellent segue to our last question before we turn to audience questions, which is how do we protect human rights for women, for the Coptic Christians, and for other minorities in an Egypt where the Muslim Brotherhood rules? I don't think that we can use anything but economic carrot and stick. I think we can impose considerable penalties on each for violating human rights, including export import issues, seizure of the uh, accounts of officials abroad, and so forth. And there's a, if we wanted to make life difficult for a lot of very powerful people in Egypt, it would not be that hard to the Treasury Department going after offshore accounts and so forth. So I think we need to create a set of very strong disincentives to violate human rights and attach that to incentives to um, uh, uh, to respecting uh, human rights and the rights of the political opposition. Uh, that said, uh, it, I don't know and I don't think we should, uh, I don't think we can know at this point how effective we're going to be. Egypt is in the hands of people we don't like who don't like us and our extent to influence the situation might be limited. Nonetheless, we need to do the best we can. So I take that next. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, I very much agree with what, just, what David just said as well. Um, I I don't think any military solution is, is, is available. You know, certainly we're not going to get attack one of our <laughs> technically one of our allies. <laughs> but uh, of course, if there was an, an, an active physical you know, purge of Christians and, and Baha'is or whatever else one, they, they might go after, whoever else they might attack, uh, we would have to do something. But then again, I don't think President Obama would do anything. Uh, maybe the next president would if it happens under the next president. But uh, we have to make sure that's extremely intense pressure done economically and also diplomatically. I think that we have to get the Europeans and other people um, very much on, our, on board with this because I think that they have been very, very uninterested in the internal dynamics in Egypt. Uh, the European Union is basically, the, the European Union and as well as the IMF and other institutions have been very willing to turn a blind eye to, just as our own administration has, uh, to the abuses of the Morsi regime and to its actual nature and character and its intentions. And uh, they, they have openly stated that they're not concerned with whether or not uh, Morsi is a good or bad leader in that sense. They're concerned with his economic program. So uh, the, all this glorious talk of the Arab Spring and uh, you know, democracy, nobody really believed it mattered. It's, it's still the same transactional relationship in a sense. Uh, that existed with Hosni Mubarak, uh, whereas uh, he <coughs> kept the peace, you know, he kept the peace treaty going and uh, he created a, a good environment for business and uh, overall. And that, for that, that was why he continued to get our aid and because of our aid, he got lots of other aid because that was all pinned upon, on the same basis, on, based on the same things. And the same evaluation of his performance. So. We now have a, a situation where we don't care if the man's a dictator, once again. And all we care about is that he maintains law and order in the neighborhood, not whether he upholds human rights law or human rights principles at home. So, and he's, he's actually a Democrat or not. So he can be a dictator you know, openly so, and it doesn't matter. Uh, but I also want to second what Cindy was saying about the civil uh, organizations, civil society, and, op and genuine opposition. Uh, the reason we are where we are now is because President Obama chose to support the Muslim Brotherhood from the very beginning, and uh, he threw all of his weight behind them, uh, even though he spoke in coded language to the media about it. Uh, they all knew the, who the strongest so-called opposition group was, and they, they knew who would take power when it was all over. And they were determined to work with them and to be on their side. There was even a paper written in August uh, in 2010, apparently an 18-page report, given to the president, which said that uh, there was going to be something like the so-called Arab Spring, an Arab revolt would be de developing in the region, and 
popular uprisings would develop, and the Muslim Brotherhood would be the most legitimate uh, opposition group to back, because they represented the future, and they were actually moderates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they, this, 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 this idea was formulated as policy uh, for President Obama, and he accepted it in August of 2010, reportedly. So uh, we, we can see how that, and we didn't give any aid to, to the NGOs. We didn't encourage NGOs that worked with the uh, liberal secularists, you know, the, the secular liberal groups that existed in Egypt. They could have been strengthened, they were disorganized, they were in disarray, they didn't have money. Uh, the woman from the Carnegie Endowment uh, stated the administration's view of this. Uh, at the time, and that was when they called the Muslim Brotherhood for a, a conference in March of 2012 to Washington uh, to get ready for their rule, basically, because they had won the parliamentary elections already. Uh, they had to train them in democracy, you're right, to discuss democracy issues with them. Uh, they said, we chose the Muslim Brotherhood because they were the best organized. As if, that's like saying uh, in, in you know, in pre-Nazi Germany, and when Hitler's about, Hitler's about to take power, the Nazis are about to rise to power. We say to them, we say to the, uh, uh, to the public that we chose to back the Nazi party because they looked the most promising. The most efficient. You know, they, they were the strongest. Hey, uh, Cynthia, did you want to comment on that or? I, I, yeah, I okay. Just... Hey, one thing that is absolutely true, but it's also not factual because the, the Muslim Brotherhood, although they were the only political group that had freedom under Mubarak, uh, they were not the most organized and they were not the only ones who were organized. The democratic bloc that had numerous uh, liberal, secular, even socialist parties, it was a coalition against the Muslim Brotherhood. It had millions of members, more than the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and they were better organized, at least they do not kill each other uh, when they have a political dispute like Islamists do, but yet they continue to support the Islamists and the terrorists. It's an ideological preference, and uh, they, they try to give it legitimacy by saying that they're organized, or the numbers, and they're both arguments are untrue and are lies. I'd like to add to that, actually, that uh, be that as it may, the, the, the administration did see them as the strongest because they had they have a military wing. Exactly. <laughs> they, they also have the, have the most penetration of, uh, of, of Egyptian state institutions of any of any single group. They are everywhere in Egyptian society. They've been patiently building this infrastructure of their own. Uh, whereas you can have millions of members in the groups that oppose them or have different principles, uh, but they're not as if, as well organized at the grassroots level, and that's that was the, the strength of the Muslim Brotherhood, in my opinion. 